Hi guys! Welcome to another episode of Attorney Javier's Philippine Law Lectures for Students. Today, we'll be continuing our discussion on the Cooperative Code and so far, we have already discussed the nature, characteristics, and privileges of cooperatives. We have also tackled how to create cooperatives as well as the incidents in the life of cooperatives. So today, we'll be discussing the powers and responsibilities of cooperatives, but take note that this is not meant to be an all-encompassing discussion because the law, the articles, or the bylaws of cooperatives may provide for other powers and responsibilities as long as, of course, it is not contrary to law, morals, public policy. Okay? So take this as a general overview of the basic powers and responsibilities of cooperatives. So if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Also, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not meant to be a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. A like on this or any of my other videos would also be greatly appreciated. Now let's begin. Okay? So to review, a cooperative only begins to exist from the moment that the Cooperative Development Authority or CDA issues a Certificate of Registration granting the application for registration filed by the persons desiring to form a cooperative. It is registration that is the operative act that allows a cooperative to exist as an entity with a personality separate and distinct from the directors, officers, and members that compose it. Aside from granting the right to exist, registration also allows the cooperative to exercise the powers allowed under the law and its articles of cooperation. Now, the express powers granted by law to cooperatives are listed in Article 9 of the Cooperative Code as amended and are the following. First, to the exclusive use of its registered name. We had previously discussed in episode 2 what can and cannot be used as a cooperative name and it is this name which sets it apart from other entities and which allows it to use the next power which is to sue and be sued under such cooperative name. Next, a cooperative is also granted the power of succession which we had already discussed extensively in episode 1. But to review, by virtue of this perpetual succession, cooperatives have the capacity for continuous existence even in case of death of any member, which death will not have any effect on the cooperative entity, which continues to exist and hold its properties, rights, and obligations until it is dissolved or existence otherwise terminated. The next power is to amend its Articles of Cooperation. The power is listed as just to amend and not to adopt because the, ad the act of adopting articles is not a power granted by law but rather a requirement imposed for registration as we have already discussed in Episode 2. Now, in order to amend any provision or matter for legitimate purposes in the Articles, or the bylaws for that matter, a vote of two-thirds of all the members with voting rights is necessary. Such amendments must indicate or underscore the changes made and of course, must still contain all the provisions required by law to be set forth therein. Now, if there are some members that dissent or do not agree with the amendments, then they may exercise their right to withdraw their membership. Now, a copy of the amended articles or bylaws, as the case may be, should be certified under oath by the secretary and majority of the directors, stating that the amendments were duly approved by two-thirds of the members with voting rights, and this copy will be submitted to the CDA. Now, the amendments will only take effect either upon approval by the CDA or within 30 days from filing if not acted upon by the CDA without the fault of the cooperative. Next, 
the cooperative also has the power to adopt bylaws, which as discussed in episode 2, are simply the internal rules of the cooperative, which include rules on qualifications, rights, liabilities, transfer of assets, and termination of membership, rules on meetings, and other internal rules. Now, the power to adopt bylaws is subject to the limitation that the same must not be contrary to law, morals, or public policy. The law further grants the cooperative the power to amend and repeal the bylaws following the procedure that I had just discussed earlier. Moving on, a cooperative is given by law the power to purchase, receive, take or grant, hold, convey, sell, lease, pledge, mortgage, and otherwise deal with such real or personal property as the transaction of the lawful affairs of the cooperative may reasonably and necessarily require, subject of course to the limitations prescribed by law and the constitution. A cooperative also has the power to enter into division, merger, or consolidation, which I had already extensively discussed in episode 3 of this series. Next, a cooperative has the power to form subsidiary cooperatives and to join federations or unions. A subsidiary cooperative refers to any organization, all or a minority of whose membership or shareholders come from a cooperative called a parent cooperative. It is organized for the purpose other than that of the parent cooperative. Okay, so different from the purpose of the parent cooperative and it receives technical, managerial, and financial assistance from the parent cooperative. Now, as for federations and unions, I had discussed these more extensively in episode 1, but to review, federations are formed by registered cooperatives who engage in the same businesses. While unions are made up of registered cooperatives and federations who group themselves together as members to represent the interest and welfare of all types of cooperatives at the provincial, city, regional, or national levels. Next, a cooperative is granted the power to avail of loans, be entitled to credit, and to accept and receive grants, donations, and assistance from foreign and domestic sources, but only if the conditions in the said loans, credits, grants, donations, or assistance will not undermine the autonomy of the cooperative. Okay? Take note of that. Now, the law also allows cooperatives to avail of preferential rights granted to cooperatives under Republic Act No. 7160, otherwise known as the Local Government Code, as well as other laws, particularly those in the grant of franchises to establish, construct, operate, and maintain ferries, wharves, markets, or slaughterhouses, and to lease public utilities including access to extension and on-site research services and facilities related to agriculture and fishery activities. Cooperatives also have the power to organize and operate schools in accordance with Repu Republic Act No. 9155 or the Governance of Basic Education Act of 2001 and other pertinent laws. And finally, the law allows cooperatives to exercise such other powers granted by the cooperative code or such powers as are necessary to carry out its purpose or purposes as stated in its Articles of Cooperation. One such example of other powers granted by the code would include, among others, the power of a cooperative under Article 78 to invest its capital in shares or securities of any other cooperative or shares issued or guaranteed by the government or to invest in banks in the locality or real estate primarily for the use of the cooperative or its members or in any other manner authorized in the bylaws. 
Now, if the cooperatives have powers, they also bear responsibilities, which in general include the purposes, objectives, and goals of cooperatives as set forth in Articles 6 and 7 of the Code as amended, and which we have already discussed in the first episode of this series. However, the Code further provides for specific responsibilities of cooperatives, which we can talk about more in detail now. One of the duties imposed by the Code can be found in Article 51, which requires every cooperative to register with the CDA an official postal address to which all notices and communications shall be sent. Another responsibility imposed by law is set forth in Article 52, which requires every cooperative to have the following documents or records ready and accessible not only to its members but also to representatives of the CDA for inspection during reasonable office hours at its official address. First, a copy of the Cooperative Code, regulations of the CDA, and other laws pertaining to cooperatives. Second, a copy of the cooperative's articles and bylaws. Third, a register of members, which, according to Article 54, shall serve as prima facie evidence of the date on which the name of any person was entered in the register and the date on which any such person ceased to be a member. Okay? Fourth, the cooperative is also required to keep and allow access to books of the minutes of the meetings of the General Assembly, Board of Directors, and committees. Next, share books where applicable. Next, the cooperative is required to keep and allow access to their financial statements, which must be audited according to generally accepted auditing standards, principles, and practices. These financial statements must be published annually and kept posted in a conspicuous place in the principal office of the cooperative. So, that's the list of documents under Article 52. But take note, the cooperative may also keep and allow access to other documents as may be prescribed by law or by the bylaws. This duty of the cooperative to allow access to its members to the documents I just mentioned is correlative to the right of the members to examine the said records during reasonable hours on business days and to demand in writing for a copy of excerpts from the said records without charge except of course for the cost of production. In case of violation of this duty, the law punishes any director or officer of the cooperative who refuses to allow any member of the cooperative to examine and copy excerpts from its records with imprisonment, a fine, and damages except if it is proven that the member has improperly used information from records that he had previously obtained or was not acting in good faith or for a legitimate purpose in making this demand. Further, the law requires cooperatives to maintain records of accounts which will be used to ascertain the true and correct condition as well as the results of the operation of the cooperative at any given time and in this regard, the law charges accountants or bookkeepers of the cooperative with responsibility for the maintenance of the cooperative in accordance with generally accepted accounting practices. So, this duty to keep and allow access to documents, books, and records goes hand in hand with Article 84, which mandates that every cooperative shall keep and carefully preserve said records at its principal office and take all necessary precaution to prevent their loss, destruction, or falsification. However, do these documents, records, or books have to be kept by the cooperative indefinitely or forever? Well, of course, if they want to, they can. But the law allows the cooperative to dispose of any documents, records, or books 
pertaining to its financial and non-financial operations which are already more than 5 years old by burning or any other method of complete destruction. Take note that this provision on disposal is subject to other laws such as but not limited to the National Internal Revenue Code among others which may provide for more specific rules for particular documents, or records, or situations such as in case of financial statements. Now to proceed with disposal, the secretary and chairman of the audit committee have to make and certify an inventory of the audited documents, records, and books to be disposed of and present this inventory to the board of directors which may approve the disposition. However, the cooperative cannot dispose of documents, records, or books that are subject of civil, criminal, or administrative proceedings. So that's it for the documents and records. Let's move on to reports. Article 53, as augmented by the implementing rules, requires that every cooperative shall make regular reports of its program of activities including those in pursuance of their socio-civic undertakings showing their progress and achievements at the end of every fiscal year specifically the reports that must be submitted to the cda include first the cooperative annual performance report or capr second the social audit report, including its program of activities in pursuance of its social civic undertakings, showing its achievements at end, end of every uh, fiscal year. Third, performance report. Fourth, audited financial statements duly stamped received by the BIR. And fifth, the list of officers and trainings undertaken or completed. Okay? In case of federations and unions, additional reports are required, such as the list of cooperatives which have remitted their respective cooperative education and training funds, business consultancy assistance to include the nature and cost, and other training activities. Now, these reports must be made accessible to the members and must be filed with the CDA within 120 days from the end of the calendar year. Filing of the said reports is mandatory, such that failure to file the same with the CDA is not only subject the accountable officer or officers to fines and penalties, but may also be a ground for the revocation of the authority of the cooperative to operate. However, the accountable officer or officers may request reconsideration in case the delay in submission of reports was due to fortuitous events. Moving forward, another duty imposed by law is that the bylaws of a cooperative must provide for the creation of certain committees, specifically the following. An audit committee and an election committee, the members of which shall be elected by the General Assembly. We also have the Ethics Committee and the Mediation and Conciliation Committee, the members of which shall be appointed by the Board. Now, aside from the committees that I mentioned, cooperatives may create such other committees as may be necessary for the conduct of the affairs of the cooperative. They may even create an executive committee to which the board can delegate certain powers and duties. The members of this executive committee are to be appointed by the board of directors and are granted such powers and duties as may be delegated to it in the bylaws or by a majority vote of all the members of the board of directors. Now, let's talk about the audit committee for a bit. The audit committee is responsible for the continuous and periodic review of the books and records of account of the cooperative to ensure that these are in accordance with the generally accepted accounting practices. To do this, the audit committee has the power and duty 
to continuously monitor the adequacy and effectiveness of the cooperative's management control system and to audit the performance of the cooperative and its various responsibility centers. Because of the nature of such duties, the law states that the audit committee shall be directly accountable and responsible to the General Assembly. This goes hand in hand with the responsibility imposed by law on cooperatives that they be subjected to three annual audits, namely financial, performance, and social audits. Now, the financial audit has to be conducted by an external auditor who is independent of the cooperative or any of its sub subsidiaries that he is auditing. He must be a member in good standing of the Philippine Institute of Certified Public Accountants or PICPA and accredited by both the Board of Accountancy and the CDA. The auditor has to submit the financial audit report to the Board of Directors and to the Audit Committee, which has to be in accordance with the generally accepted auditing standards for cooperatives as jointly promulgated by the PICPA and the CDA. The complete audit report then has to be presented by the Board to the General Assembly at its next meeting. Take note that the auditor cannot be held liable in an action for defamation that is based on any act, uh, deed, or statement made by him in good faith or in connection with any matter that he is authorized or required to do pursuant to the cooperative code. Now let's move on to the social audit. Okay? So we remember that a cooperative is both an economic and social enterprise. And as such, the social contribution of the cooperative has to indicate the improvement of the social welfare, not only of its members, but of the community as a whole as well. Thus, the social audit is a systematic review of the attitudes, values, behavior, and degree of interaction of people within the cooperative, as well as the policies, programs, and activities being implemented by the cooperative. It is a procedure wherein the cooperative assesses its social impact and ethical performance against its stated mission, vision, goals, and code of social responsibility. It further enables the cooperative to develop a process whereby it can account for its social performance and evaluate its impact in the community and be accountable for its decisions and actions to its regular members. Thus, the social audit has to look into the level of participation of the members and officers into the operations of the cooperative, the impact of the cooperative programs and policies on the community, and the uses of the community development fund. Now, the social audit has to be conducted by an independent social auditor accredited by the CDA. The social audit has to be submitted to the board as part of the Cooperative Annual Progress Report or CAPR mentioned earlier before being submitted to the CDA. Failure of the cooperative to submit the social audit to the CDA may result in the imposition of the corresponding fines and penalties. As for the performance audit, this simply refers to an audit on the efficiency and effectiveness of the cooperative as a whole, its management and officers, and its various responsibility centers as basis for improving individual team or overall performance and for objectively informing the general membership on such performance. Now, we move on to the last few responsibilities imposed by the Code on Cooperatives. Article 75 mandates that the bylaws of every cooperative shall provide for a member capital build-up program that has to be reasonable and realistic 
in order to allow for the continuing growth of the members' investment in the cooperative as their economic conditions continue to improve. Okay, so it's a member capital build-up program. And then next, we have the responsibilities of cooperatives in relation to allocation and distribution of net surplus. The definition of net surplus is based on the principle of patronage refund, which is a principle of equity where an equal right of members to participate in the organization and to equitably share in the benefits accruing is established. The patronage fund itself refers to the amount returned to individual members in proportion to their individual patronage of the cooperative's products and services. Following the principle of patronage refund, the net surplus will not be considered as profit. It is rather considered as an excess of payments made by the members for the loans borrowed or the goods and services availed by them from the cooperative. Net surplus may also refer to the difference of the rightful amount due to the members for their products sold or services rendered to the cooperatives, including other inflow of assets resulting from its other operating activities and which shall be deemed to have been returned to the members if the same is distributed following the order of distribution set by the code, namely, first to the reserve fund. For the first five years of operation after registration, an amount not less than 50% of the net surplus and thereafter at least 10% of the net surplus must be allocated to the reserve fund, which shall be used for the stability of the cooperative and to meet net, meet net losses in its operations. Again, the reserve fund is used for the stability of the cooperative and to meet net losses in its operations. The amount allocated may be decreased by the General Assembly when the reserve fund already exceeds the share capital. Okay, so again, first five years of operation after registration, not less than 50% of the net surplus. After that five years, then at least 10% of the net surplus. Then thereafter, if uh, it exceeds the share capital, then the amount allocated may be decreased by the General Assembly. Take note that while the reserve fund itself cannot be used for investment except when allowed by law, the amount in excess of the share capital may be used at any time for any project that would expand the operations of the cooperative upon resolution of the General Assembly. Also, review the discussion in the last episode on the prohibition on distribution of the reserve fund to members in case of dissolution of the cooperative. Specifically, the fund can only be uh, established as a usufructuary trust fund for the affiliated federation or union or donated to the community when the cooperative is dissolved. Second in the order of distribution, is an amount not more than 10% of the net surplus, which is allotted for the Education and Training Fund, which shall provide for the training, development, and similar other cooperative activities that are geared toward the growth of the cooperative movement. Remember that upon dissolution, the unexpended balance of this fund shall be credited to the education and training fund of a chosen federation or union. Next, an amount not less than 3% of the net surplus is to be distributed for the community development fund which shall be used for projects or activities that will benefit the community where the cooperative operates. Now, the cooperative may choose to create an optional fund into which they may divert a portion of the net surplus but not to exceed 7%. 
Now, this may be for land and building or any other fund which the cooperative may deem necessary. If there still remains net surplus after following the order of distribution, the remainder shall be made available to the members in the form of interest on share capital, but in an amount not exceeding the normal rate of return on investments and patronage refunds. Now, while I won't be discussing the specific rules on proportionate amounts of patronage refunds for members, non-members, and subscribers, please note that the sum allocated for the patronage refunds should be made available at the same rate to all patrons of the cooperative in proportion to their individual patronage. Moreover, the amount allocated for patronage refund should not be less than 30% of the net surplus after deducting the statutory reserves based on the principle of equity. But the rate of patronage refund cannot be more than twice the rate of interest on share capital. If any amount remains after the allowable interest and patronage refund have been deducted, then it will be credited to the reserve fund. Okay, so that's it for the discussion on the basic powers and responsibilities of cooperatives under the cooperative code. Now, I hope you may have learned a thing or two. Stay tuned for the next episode on uh, administration and membership in cooperatives. And I hope to see you soon, guys. Bye!